there we go. Okay, people are coming on in. Hey, everybody. Sorry, we were having a little bit of technical issues there. Hopefully, everyone's having a good day. Looks like everyone's kind of piling in. Boom, boom, boom. All right. Excellent. That's why I needed you here, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I have done something right today. I've showed Dave how to click the turn off practice mode button. <laughs> uh, I was spending like an hour trying to figure out where practice mode was too, and I had no idea I was in practice mode. It was automatically in practice mode. Yeah, awesome. there we go. And we're already on Facebook Live, so you can see uh, our fun conversation we we're having over there amongst yourself trying to figure things out. If you're on Facebook Live, let's see, uh, have friends. Uh, so we got Andrea on Facebook saying hello. Seb, hey guys, saying hello. Uh, Stefan, uh, another Andrea. True behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. It's a true behind the scenes. But we got it all working now. Uh, luckily, we don't need technology to run our e-commerce businesses. LOL. Yeah. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't know what we're doing. But uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, give everyone a few more minutes to just kind of hop in here. Cool. Sorry, I'm just kind of messing around with the interface here. Some more behind the scenes. So when I click share a screen, it's going to share the entire screen, not the you can share, select a window. I think you can select, select a, window a window as window. well. Okay. Uh, Emil says, hey guys, hello. Good, good, good to hear from you. So we had several people in here now, which is awesome. We're gonna give everyone about one or two more minutes before Dave gets started. You all pack, Mike? I haven't packed a stitch clothing. I have a pile of stuff here that somehow needs to end up in my suitcase or suitcases. Uh, it's it's a laughable amount of a lot of crap. I'm like I'm in the room that we've like been staging everything, and uh, there's a lot there's a lot here. I, I like don't for know clothes or for other things? It's like a bunch of everything. There's well, there's two bags of beef jerky in this box. I'm not sure exactly how that uh, belongs in uh, beef jerky. Now a big thing in the Philippines. Yeah, well, I think that they seem to love uh, snacks. So whenever we bring snacks, they, they were happy. And there's a bag of toffee almonds, which I kind of want to open up myself and, and eat right now. And then we, we have a, those in Hong Kong last time. Yeah, no, they're, they're addictive. And uh, the rest of it's all samples. Um, yeah, so if we get stopped at, uh, at, at customs for what's in this box of samples, it'll be pretty funny because it's all like uh, after birthing products. And uh, <laughs> it's like one of the things we're working on right now. So yeah, uh, it would be pretty, pretty interesting. There's a great app that you can get. Uh, lets you time your cycles. It works wonderfully. <laughs> well, not your nice. cycles. I guess your wife's. Yeah. Well, this is like, this is not for her. This is for the uh, products. For you. Launch rice wrap. So that is for me. Yeah, <laughs> you <know. laughs> but you're talking about something else. No, no, this is a, uh, no, I was actually being here. serious. This is really, these are really products we're looking to, to launch. So, um, cool. I think, uh, what do you guys think about getting started? Let's see if there's any more comments here real quick. Uh, nope, no comments there. So I'll keep an eye on the comments, Dave. And I guess yeah, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do this one just on my own guys. It's kind of a, uh, kind of a prep for a presentation I'm giving at global sources. So Mike will join us for Q and a, but it, during the presentation for the most part, He'll kind of be doing his own thing, packing up and looking at after birthing products. <laughs> okay, and bear with me here a minute. Let's see, I click share screen. There we go. Okay, so can we see the PowerPoint now? Yes, looks great. Is it full? Is it kind of in preview mode? mode it's, or yeah, it it's in, in a preview editing? mode. So you need to hit. Uh... Perfect. We're all good. Small product improvements for big returns. Yes. So I'm captivated. This webinar, I, you should be. <laughs> the title. Um, so in this talk, what we're going to talk about is things that you can do to modify your products to make them stand out from all the rest of the competition on Amazon. So the outline for today, what we're going to walk our way through is first thing what we're going to do is talk about what works and doesn't work today when you're developing products. Then we're going to go into some physical ways that you can change your products. And we'll talk about some easy differentiators that you can apply to all your products. It doesn't matter what product it is. And then we'll get into what you can do to develop cheap packaging, uh, even for a low MOQ. And like we mentioned before, we'll end it all off with a Q&A. 
Okay, so bad news, private labeling is dead. China arbitrage, finding items for really cheap in China and then selling them for a high price on Amazon, that is pretty much dead. And there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, the first one, of course, is that there's more and more competition. So we're all here in this webinar right now. We are the competition on Amazon. And there's millions of other people in America. But even worse is, even aside from Americans, there is competition now in China. When I first started going to China quite a few years back, nobody knew what Amazon was. Now, anytime I go to talk to a supplier, everybody is asking about Amazon. How can we sell on Amazon? How can our factories start selling on Amazon? So it's not really necessarily the Americans in their basement or the Europeans or the Canadians that are your competition, it's the Chinese. And why that matters is that the Chinese are way closer to the source than we're ever going to be. Uh, except for me, because I'm I'm in China right now, <laughs> but they're going to get the prices for way cheaper than we can ever do. So if you're thinking that you're going to simply compete on price, it's not going to work. So let's give you some data too on Chinese sellers. A survey of Chinese e-commerce sellers in China. Uh, that's all e-commerce sellers, whether they're selling on Taobao or Amazon China or abroad. 62% of them, of all e-commerce sellers in China, are selling on Amazon.com right now. So pretty much all the sellers that are on Taobao, they're also selling on Amazon.com. And there's some stats, the estimates of the number of Chinese sellers on Amazon aren't completely reliable because Amazon hasn't released that data. But the low estimate is 10% of all third-party sellers in China are, or all third-party sellers in America are from China. Uh, some higher estimates put that at 25%. And again, if you think that logistics are the big kind of barrier to entry for the Chinese, it's definitely not. So you might have heard of China, China Post and uh, ePacket. So this is an arrangement that China Post made with USPS. Basically means that the Chinese can ship things for dirt cheap from America, uh, or from China into America. And this works obviously on a per item basis. So if somebody's shipping from China, uh, you buy a garlic press, they ship it direct to you. But along with kind of these uh, sweetheart arrangements that China Post has, there's a lot of other logistics arrangements for larger shipments in China. Amazon has warehouses all throughout China that Chinese sellers can ship to. Uh, and basically they'll ship directly from China to an Amazon warehouse. So kind of the, big point I'm making here is that you can't compete on price. That's just not enough of a uh, tactic nowadays. If it makes you feel any better, Chinese sellers' biggest fear uh, is actually other Chinese sellers. 45% of other uh, Chinese sellers said that their biggest fear is other Chinese sellers. So take some comfort in knowing that you're not alone in uh, being afraid of the, of the Chinese e-commerce <laughs> seller. Good news is Amazon's still growing at breakneck speed. So if you look at the graph there on the right, uh, Amazon's still growing well over 25% year over year. So, you know, a lot of people think, oh, am I still late to the Amazon game? Well, the tactics have definitely changed, but Amazon's still growing at such, uh, such high speed, e-commerce in general. Uh, I mean, it's kind of my opinion that there's still a lot of meat on that bone. And the big thing is that small product improvements are going to reap big rewards in most categories. Like I mentioned before, I mean, there is a continuous push to the bottom for pricing, but most people now are trying to just push on price and they're not really focusing on making small improvements to products, which if you can differentiate your product in just a little bit of a way, uh, there's so much noise on Amazon in terms of products that you're really going to separate yourself from the rest of the pack. The other thing is paid advertising is still profitable on Amazon. Me and Mike talk a lot about how Google CPC now and paid advertising isn't really profitable for trying to drive people to your website. Uh, paid advertising on Amazon, though, for the most part, is still incredibly profitable. Uh, I mean, you can you can set up a campaign and get a return of about five percent uh, average cost of sales. If, unless you're selling something at uh, absolutely no margin, that's going to make you profitable. I'm still a big believer that 99% of Consumers that are on Amazon don't realize that there's paid advertising on Amazon and they, and they think that the top one or two listings is actually the top one or two products and they don't realize that somebody's just paid their way to the top. So what I'm getting at is that if you launch a product, you can still kind of buy your way to the top. And if it's 
differentiated product, uh, you're going to have good success. And my favorite saying, revenues are vanity, profits are sanity. So again, just don't just keep on price continuously. Try to find other ways to differentiate, differentiate your products. What you used to work with private labeling. Uh, I'm old enough now where I can kind of give one of those <laughs> my, my day, back in my day stories. Uh, when I first started an e-commerce company, it was uh, around 2010. Uh, the big strategy for me was finding products for cheap in China. Nobody else was doing this. I was able to slap a logo on the box, do absolutely nothing different to the product, uh, and put it on eBay. It was pretty much the that was pretty much the sales strategy. And finding the product in China was the hard thing, uh, and all the other stuff that went with kind of marketing that product. Uh, doing an eBay listing is a lot harder than doing an Amazon listing. Uh, and then you'd wait for the money to roll in, and literally you would wait for it to get mailed in. You'd wait for cashier's checks to arrive in the mail, and then you would. <laughs> drag yourself down to the local UPS store, or in my case, a Canada Post store, and you'd ship the item. And selling stuff was a lot harder back then in a lot of ways, but Amazon's really changed. Uh, of course, we all know Amazon does all the marketing, fulfillment, customer service. Amazon does everything. Like That's not the hard part anymore is selling an item through e-commerce. The hard part is getting the product and differentiating it and making it a little bit different. It's really a product play. The big question is, how do you make these products different and how do you do it for cheap? Again, anybody can take, anybody can have a team of hundreds of people and tens of millions of dollars and completely reinvent a brand new mousetrap from the ground up. That takes a lot of money and most people aren't in that position. Most people want to invest either a few thousand dollars, maybe even tens of thousands of dollars, but most people are not looking to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, I kind of joke around a lot of times that I'm kind of like the cockroach of Amazon. I'm trying to launch products really quick and really cheap. I'm not trying to invest tens of thousands of dollars into each product launch. I want to validate products for really cheap. So how do we do that? How do we make our products different? Do it for cheap. So there's three ways that you can kind of make your product stand out. The first way is that you can physically improve the product. You can make a, you can reinvent a mousetrap, make a better mousetrap. This is going to be very product specific. What you can and you can't do for a product is really going to depend on the product type. The next thing you can do is that there's some easy product differentiators that you can apply pretty much all product categories. It doesn't matter whether you're selling a garlic press or a drone or a microphone, you can apply these to pretty much any product. And I'll get into this here shortly. And the final thing you can do is improving on your package. And packaging, I'll go into. Packaging is going to ultimately help your sales in the long run. Short run, it's not necessarily going to bump your sales, but definitely as a sales tactic in the long run, it's still really powerful. Okay, so if you're trying to make physical product changes to your product, if you're trying to uh, make your product different in some way, you have to kind of know what type of product it is because not every product you can change easily. Some products are way more uh, easily change than others. So simple products with lots of manual labor inputs are way easier to change in small batches than more complex products. So kind of my wheel well that I'm going to when I'm trying to change a product physically, I'm looking at products made of fabrics and textiles, and this is a lot bigger than simply a pair of pants. Fabric and textiles are, are, are all around you. Uh, if I'm looking in this room that I'm in right now, there's uh, my suitcase is made of a fabric. Backpack is made of a fabric. Uh, obviously, the the uh, the quilt and the bed sheets on the bed are made of fabric. Fabrics and textiles are a really big category that go well beyond just clothing products. Uh, metal products and wood products. Again, these are all around you, very easy to change. I'm going to get into some spe specific examples, but metal and wood products. Uh, just look at the room around you; they're everywhere. Now, with that being said, there's also some really hard products to change. And these tend to be products which are more complex and have more machine and technology inputs into them. And these aren't impossible to change, but if you're trying to change them for cheap, they are really, really expensive. And these kind of types of product categories, I kind of group them into a few different things. Plastics are extremely hard to change because you have really expensive mold costs. Uh, it doesn't matter if you want to just make the tiniest change to a plastic product, you're going to have to open up a new mold thousands of dollars changing that, uh, developing that mold, and 
you're going to have a huge MOQ, thousands of items. Uh, electronics and electrical, electrical items, same thing. Uh, electronics are near impossible to make micro improvements to. You want to move a headphone jack from here to there. It's not really possible for the most part, unless you're going to invest definitely tens of thousands of dollars and more likely hundreds of thousands of dollars. So fabric and textiles are your friend. Uh, you can easily change so many different things on fabrics and textiles. You can change sizes, you can change colors, you can change fabric types. Uh, you can add ship, which is kind of, uh, it's just kind of a catch all. You can take a backpack and you can say, hey, can you put a pocket here and there? A supplier is going to be able to do it for a really low MOQ and either charge you absolutely no additional money for it or a very small amount. Just to give you an example of a product that I've modified and changed just to, again, separate it from all the noise on Amazon. Just take a bag similar to this. Uh, I'm not showing my exact product just uh, for obvious reasons, but it's very similar to this. Uh, you take a bag and I basically asked, hey, can you make it a little bit bigger? And what that does is you make it a little bit bigger. Everybody's selling a 25 inch bag on Amazon. Uh, and there's a hundred listings for it. But if you're the guy with a 30 inch bag, you're going to catch all that audience that wants just a little bit bigger of a bag. Same thing, change the color of the fabric. Everybody's selling a black bag. Well, if I'm the guy now selling a camouflage bag, it really makes that image pop on Amazon. You know, it's just going to differentiate it from all of the rest of the products on Amazon. Because most people are tending to buy a product, not do anything different to change it, just selling the same one as everybody else and competing on price. Again, another thing I did, add a simple bottle holder to the bag. Does it add a lot of functionality necessarily to the bag? Or is everybody going to want a bottle holder on their bag? Maybe not, but what it does is it really just differentiates it. And I, can, I know that I can make a really good image on Amazon and say, hey, look, our bag has a bottle holder and the other guys don't. Uh, sometimes that's enough to make somebody jump on your product instead of the other guy. And for this product, uh, it was a really low MOQ. It was 300 pieces to make all these modifications. Each revision cost $40. You can do this for dirt cheap. Metals and wood can be your friend. Just like fabrics, you can change sizes, you can change types of metal. Again, you can add shit. Um, you can make a metal product or a wood product a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. You can make it out of a different fabric or a different uh, wood type, different metal type. You can do a lot of different things to it. Again, because nine times out of 10, there is no mold in a wood or a metal product. And that's kind of the scary thing when you're developing products. Mold costs tend to be very, very expensive. So I'll give an example of a product that, again, that I changed, but again, just look around you wherever you're sitting, whether it's in your office or the car or your room, there's metal and wood products all around you. What I did is simply took a license plate holder. Uh, this is actually one for a four by four. I asked uh, the factory, hey, can you make basically uh, an LED mount on the, on the license plate holder. Uh, they said, sure. I brought them a sample of an existing license plate holder. Asked, I, basically, I just showed them exactly what I wanted to have done to that license plate holder. I said, hey, can you just kind of make it an inch bigger here and put a couple holes here? They were able to do it for 50 pieces. You know, that's 50 pieces. That's about as low of an MOQ as you can get. Uh, they designed the product when you're designing something in, in metal, you need what they call a CAD design. They had a guy on site that would do that for cheap, uh, not cheap actually, for free. Basically took all my suggestions and made it into a drawing that could then be read by the machine. And so I was able to get this product, basically a brand new innovative product I developed for well under a thousand bucks. Kind of another hack that you can do too, if you're developing product out of a metal or wood, you're going to need most likely again, that CAD design. You can get a CAD design designed on uh, one of the freelance websites like Upwork. You can get it done for hundred bucks, even less sometimes. Basically just give a drawing of what you want done on a pen and paper. And then you can provide it either to a supplier on Alibaba, uh, or you can take it to a 3D printer. They can convert that design into a 3D printer readable file and print it out on a 3D printer. So uh, that you can actually have a live sample before you commit to a live or a bigger order. 
like I mentioned before, plastics and technology and elect electrical items and overall complex items are not your friend. Uh, they have expensive mold costs, expensive R&D costs, high MOQs. It is really not the type of product that you want to get into, especially if you're first starting. I know Mike is right now experimenting. He's developing a product from the ground up pretty much. Uh, he's opening mold costs. Uh, he can talk after about how much he's invested into it, but I know it's thousands of dollars. If you're first starting off, that's really not where you want to go down. It's not a road you want to go down in the beginning. Uh, later, when you have absolute uh, confidence in a product, sure, go, go to belt up. But in the beginning, uh, it can really kind of sink your business before you've even started. Okay, so strategies for all products, things that you can do no matter how complex or how simple they are. The biggest thing that I'm doing right now, looking for a lot of my products, the, if I can't change it at all, if I'm walking through a trade show or whatever and I can't change a product at all, I'm looking at way, things that I can bundle with that product. And I bundle this product with something else and kind of give a better offer. <laughs> uh, so bundling, I mean, we've all seen it. We've all encountered it, I'm sure, on Amazon. We've probably bought products which are bundled and you bought it because of that bundle. Um, bundling, what you want to do is you want to take a universally popular add-on product, something like a garlic press uh, with a garlic peel, put them together in a box. Everybody that's uh, squeezing garlic needs to get the shell off the garlic. Uh, so you get a garlic uh, peel. Obviously, you want that product to appeal to as many people as possible. Uh, me including a garlic peel with some of my four by four items isn't going to be a big incentive for people to buy. You want it to appeal to as many people as possible. And you want that item to be as inefficient to ship on its own as possible. Basically, make it so that Number one, not going to add a lot into your shipping costs. And number two, that it's an item that people want, but they won't buy on its own because it's such a high cost because of the shipping. Even if shipping's free on Amazon, uh, it's built into the cost and everybody knows that. Uh, this garlic press goes for $5 on Amazon. Everyone knows it's not a $5 press it's, or a $5 item. It's just the shipping that they're paying for. And when I'm doing this, I'm aiming for my products, the, app, the bundled product, to be 20% or less of the overall cost. So if I'm selling a $100 item, I want the bundled item to be $20 or less, more, uh, more or less. And what you're doing when you're bundling products is that you're just making a way higher perceived value and adding barely anything on to your product cost. So you go on, if you go on Amazon or anywhere else, a garlic press is going to cost you 12 bucks. Uh, garlic and that garlic peel is going to cost you five dollars. So that has a perceived value in the consumer's mind of seventeen dollars. But to add on that garlic peel is only going to cost you sixty cents. Uh, you can go on AliExpress or Alibaba and search around for prices uh, just to kind of get a sense of what that bundle product is going to cost. But what you've done is you've added less than ten percent on to your product cost, and you, but you've increased the perceived value to the consumer more than 50%. And so if everybody else is simply selling their garlic press with no peel on it, and you all of a sudden have that peeler, it's going to appeal to a lot more people. You can do this with every product aside from even the cliched uh, garlic press. Almost every product in the world, you can bundle it with something. It doesn't matter if it's a four by four product, a cooking product, uh, a drone. You know, the drone, you can include spare wings. I mean, there's a million different things that you can do. Now, that being said, uh, the strategy works well for, I would say, the vast majority of products. But the most competitive products, it's not going to work for it because it works and people are doing this. Go on to Amazon, look for the most popular products. Look for supplements and garlic presses and yoga balls and all the most popular items. People are using these strategies because they work. People are finding some cheap little add-on, bundling with the product and selling it as a package. Uh, you can see here's an Amazon page for a gar if you search for garlic press. Almost everybody is bundling it with some type of product. So where to get that product that you're going to bundle? Uh, a few different ways that you can do it. You can buy it from your current supplier. Uh, basically, if your supplier, especially if they're a trading company, they probably have a lot of different products in their catalog. Uh, ideally, they have a product that you can just source directly from them and have them package it in the box all at once. Uh, you can ask your supplier to source it for you. If they don't have it, they can probably find somebody that, can, that does have it and they'll 
package it to you uh, all together in one in one box. You can buy it from AliExpress. Uh, just if, if you've ever bought something on AliExpress and had it shipped to your house in in America or wherever you are, do the same thing, but have it shipped to your supplier's factory, and then just ask them to box it all together. They'll do it nine times out of ten for no additional cost. They'll take those two items and box it together for you. Uh, the other thing you could do, and the harder you get into finding that bundled item, the more harder it is for you to find it, the more of a barrier to entry that you're going to uh, develop to keep other competitors away from you. So if you can buy it from another supplier, like not an AliExpress supplier, but somebody that you have to find on Alibaba and actually make an official purchase order with, that's going to eliminate a lot of your competition. And if you do it that way, uh, you'll have a lot longer runway that you can have with that product before you get a lot of competition and you'll probably get a cheaper price on the bundled item as well. The next kind of secret bonus hack that you can do for all your items which again works really well on a lot of products and it, it might look kind of shallow but what you can do is you can put a carrying ba uh, bag in your for your item. This obviously doesn't apply to every product you're not going to put a bed in a carrying bag but uh, a lot of things you can put in a carrying bag, a lot more things than you imagine. So what you do is you simply, you take a product, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a microphone that I'm talking with right now, uh, the laptop that I'm doing this webinar from could be put in a nice carrying bag. Uh, the carrying bag isn't gonna add a lot of cost to the actual product, but what it's really going to do is make your main Amazon image pop. Uh, so you take your main Amazon image, it's going to be a picture of that product with the bag superimposed either in the background or beside the product. Uh, Amazon said, I think Amazon's terms still say that your main image is supposed to be just the product itself. I, nobody is enforcing this unless, unless somebody actually reports you and Amazon wants to remove the product image, you're not going to ever have your image removed. And if it does get removed, uh, so be it. You just add it as an additional image. You're not going to get your listing suspended or anything. It will just have your main image. Uh, I've given a few examples of carrying bags here and how much they cost. This really nice bag on top with a nice zippered up opening, uh, carrying bag made of really high quality fabric, about 350. Uh, this really small sunglass bag like you see here at the bottom or in the middle, about 33 cents. And just kind of a lower, lower grade version of the first bag uh, is about $1.70. So you're looking at about $2 to add a really nice bag to your item. To find these bags, what you can do is you can just simply ask your supplier to source them from you. Uh, most packaging factories are probably going to have uh, either bags themselves, so they'll have a connection. So your, your supplier is already working with these packaging factories, so they can source these bags pretty, pretty easily. If you're doing it a higher volume though, if you're ordering thousands of bags, uh, it's probably worthwhile for you to actually find the source yourself. Go to Alibaba, look for bag uh, manufacturers, try to have them shipped, uh, have them shipped to your supplier and then just ask them to include the item with that bag. And as my wife says, everyone loves a nice bag. So you, uh, you're, going to just, you're going to attract a bigger audience by putting what this quote unquote petty item with your item. You can, you can see some examples of, you know, of carrying bags being offered with product. Sunglasses, we've all seen that before. And you never bought a pair of sunglasses, you probably get this cute little carrying bag with it. Uh, it does make the image pop a lot more on Amazon, opposed to just simply having the sunglasses on their own. We've had a lot of people buy our products and they said, well, I haven't tried the product yet and they'll leave a review. I haven't tried the product yet, but the bag looks really good. And it's kind of their first impression that they're going to have of your product. Next, we're gonna get into some packaging improvements that you can make for your products. Again, these are going to apply to all different types of products, no matter if they're complex, simple, uh, whether it's a $4,000 drone or a $5 garlic rub. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure that there's no excess packaging in your items because it's going to kill your profit margins. It's going to make it really hard for you to compete on price. The big one that you wanna do is that you want to make sure that your items are not being inefficiently packed into an oversized item because an oversized item by Amazon's uh, metrics is going to cost about 50% more to ship uh, a lot of times. So if you're not familiar with Amazon's oversized 
slash standard size metrics. Basically, any item that's more than 18 inches on the longest side is going to be classified as oversized by Amazon. I've given a couple of examples here. An item that's 18.01 inches, so just barely over 18 inches uh, on its longest side, it's going to cost almost $10 to ship. Uh, an item that's just barely under that 18 inches, 17.99 inches, is going to cost you about $650. So it's almost a, it's over a 50% price difference between a standard size item and a oversized item. Just want to mention real quick, Dave, you have the, the price is yeah, super know, proposed there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and when you're asking, ask your supplier, the first thing you want to do is ask them for a measurement of the box that your product is going to ship in. And don't ask them to give you the numbers, ask them to take a photograph of a measuring tape beside the box, because the supplier is normally just going to estimate. So you want to actually see it kind of uh, in the flesh, what that dimension is. Uh, I, I have a supplier that I'm working with right now. I told her over and over again last year, they, can't be any, can't even be a centimeter over, uh, over 18 inches. Uh, okay, okay, no problem, no problem, no problem. Probably told her five or six times. Of course, the second it gets into uh, an FBA warehouse, it's 18.25 inches. Uh, and I said, what happened? And she said, well, it was just a little bit over 18 inches. In China, there's a little bit, there's not necessarily as objective and black and white thinking as we have, especially when it comes to standard size and oversized items. They're not familiar. Uh, so just really make sure that you get a picture of a measuring tape beside your box. And whatever dimension you get, add 0 0.5 inches. Amazon is going to do their very best to try to measure that item uh, to the longest dimension possible. So if it's uh, an overstuffed box, it's, they're going to measure at the most stuffed angle of that box. So make sure if you're getting a box and you measure it to be 17.8 inches, Amazon's probably going to measure it as being <clears throat> the next thing you do, once your items do get checked into FBA, check to see what FBA is measuring them as. <clears throat> and then whatever they measure them as, if it's uh, slightly over any kind of threshold, ask, go into your seller central and ask, open a case and ask seller central to remeasure the item for you. Seller central will measure any item for you, uh, remeasure any item for you kind of on demand. So I've had it with a lot of our products. They're just, they're really close to that 18 inches mark. The first time Amazon measures them, they'll be 18.1 inch or something along that line. I also ask for them to remeasure it and they'll remeasure it as 17.8 inches. Just by that one seller central case, you can save yourself thousands of dollars. Okay, so aside from packaging efficiencies, how can we develop great packaging and how can we do it for cheap? Great packaging isn't going to necessarily immediately help your products. Uh, in terms of sales, but in the long run, it's going to. First, it gives a great first impression of your product. It's the first impression that the person gets of your product. They haven't even seen the product yet, but it, obviously the, the box has to be opened. Uh, it's going to result in more reviews in the long run. It makes people overlook product flaws. It makes them think that features are there that aren't necessarily there. Uh, we've all kind of fallen into that, that scam of a great box and thinking it's a great product. And we've also done the same thing with a, with a shitty box and thinking it's a shitty product. So make sure that you invest in your packaging. Again, just, just classic review. Somebody wrote on one of our products, oh, this thing is awesome. The bag that came in is fantastic. Looking forward to using it. You're reviewing the product without ever using the product. That's what we're going for. So kind of the cream of the crop in terms of packaging is probably a full color box. Uh, everyone wants a nice full color box, which has colorful graphics and everything. The problem with full color boxes is that the MOQ on them, the minimum order quantity, is always really high. It's always at least 500 pieces and often 1,000 pieces plus. If you can do those types of volumes, you're looking at around 50 cents to anywhere up to three, four dollars, depending on the size. The crappy thing is that paper prices in China in the last uh, probably six months have almost doubled. So whatever you're paying in boxes last year, you're probably paying double this year. Uh, I was just talking to a student in our course right now. She, she was wondering, well, geez, you guys are talking about $2 for boxes and I'm paying almost four. Well, some of the videos were recorded before the big paper increase, which happened uh, late in 2016. So boxing prices have gone up. 
So just keep that in mind. Take it anything that you read. Uh, take it with a big grain of big grain of salt that box prices may have increased. Uh, so what can we do though if we want to get full color boxes, but we don't want to order thousands of boxes? Well, there's a few things you can do. Number one is to simply ask your supplier to keep the excess boxes for you. Order a thousand boxes at fifty cents each. So you spend five hundred dollars on boxes. Maybe you only want to order a hundred items. So they keep the other 900 boxes for you. I would much rather have $450 of boxes sitting at my supplier, just kind of collecting dust until my next order, rather than buying a thousand dollars or a thousand pieces of a $20 item, which I haven't yet validated. I don't know if I'm going to sell a thousand pieces on Amazon. I don't know if I can even sell one. I don't want to commit to a thousand piece order, uh, but at the same time, I want that full color box. So that's something you can do. Just have your supplier keep the excess boxes. Uh, when you're developing your boxes, if you have variations, don't develop a separate box for each variation. Just keep everything in as few as few of boxes as possible. So if you have a box, full color box, uh, you have blue, red, green, white, have check boxes on that box that the supplier can simply check off to identify what variation of that product is. And the next thing you can do is uh, simply have generic, um, generic branded boxes for multiple product types. Even if they're different products, even if it's a rope and a bag, if it's kind of the, similar, the same dimensions, you can put it in the same branded box with your logo on it, maybe some generic artwork. Uh, I'm in the off-road space, so we have a box with basically off-road theming to it. It doesn't matter which product it is, we can still use that box for multiple You can't get a full color box and not everybody can. Um, there's quantity issues. Uh, there's also the fact that a really large item is not necessarily going to practically go into a full color box. Uh, if, you're in that, if you're in that case, whatever you do, never ship an item in a brown box. Okay, at the very least, what you wanna do is ship it in a white box. A white box just looks a lot better than uh, some crappy brown box. And if you're shipping the white box, Another little hack that you can do is take your white box, add a full color sticker onto the box. And what that sticker will do is that sticker, uh, you can develop it for really cheap. It's about five to 10% of the cost of a full color box. And it's going to give the impression of a full color box. You just ask your supplier to have that sticker made. You give them the artwork. Uh, they print out those stickers and they simply stick them onto the front of the box. You'll go, again, you'll do it for five to 10% of the cost and you'll, get pretty much the same effect of, as a full color box. The other thing you can do is you can ask your supplier if they have an agnostic unbranded box. I've dealt with suppliers in the past. Uh, we dealt with a clock manufacturer. They had this really beautiful generic clock box. It had a bunch of uh, clocks on the box. There was no branding on it, no uh, logos or anything. Uh, but basically any customer could use this box and uh, people aren't gonna notice if it has your logo on it or anything, but they do notice if it's a nice box. So you're able to basically co-pack your item or not co-pack, but share the box cost with a bunch of other suppliers or uh, buyers and not have the high MOQs that you'll have developing a box from scratch. And one last thing for the poly baggers. Um, Mike absolutely hates poly bags. Um, we try to avoid it too. Uh, sometimes it's unavoidable to ship something in a poly bag. If you're going to do it, at least make the poly bag as acceptable as possible. The poly bags are measured from one mil, basically measured in mils. Uh, one mil is a really thin, really bad quality bag. Uh, six mil is kind of like an industrial grade uh, poly bag. Whatever you do, don't ship something in a one mil poly bag. If, if you're shipping, if you're buying an item from your supplier, ask them what uh, quality of poly bag is it? What, what uh, grade of poly bag is it? Aim to have something at least three mils or bigger for a poly bag. Poly bag is the cost is like two cents. So at least spend, you know, a three mil bag compared to a one ba mil bag is going to cost about double the money, but double the money of two or three cents is not a lot of money. So just figure out what grade of poly bag they're using and go for something a little bit higher grade. Also with poly bags, there's different types of poly bags. You can actually get some, I hate to use the word cool, but you can get some cool poly bags. You can get a zipper poly bag there's different types of zippers that you can get. You can get uh, kind of your Ziploc, your traditional Ziploc bag. You can get a slider. There's different types of poly bags that you can get. Uh, you can get a button bag too. And 
poly bag that has a button on it. Uh, there's different things that you can do with a poly bag if you have to ship it in a poly bag. And the first thing I recommend for you to do, go to Uline.com, the big packaging supplier in America, browse their poly bag section. Uh, you don't need to go to a Chinese website and fumble through Chinese to figure out what poly bag uh, types are and what the cost is approximately. Just go there, educate yourself, and then when you talk to your supplier, you can be a little bit more knowledgeable. And if, you're, if you are shipping in a poly bag, whatever you do, put a full color label on the inside. Uh, don't just ship it in the bag, put a full color label on the inside. Just give, again, give them the artwork, say, hey, can you print this out, put it in the, in the front of the poly bag. Gives a little bit better bam kind of when the customer gets it. And finally, uh, the last thing that everybody should be doing doesn't matter what product you're selling, doesn't matter how simple and even though you may think it's stupid proof, uh, most products aren't stupid proof. They require a little bit of instruction that goes with them. So, the first thing I do whenever I'm developing a product is I ask my supplier, do you have any instructions? They do have the instructions, great. I take their instructions and now I know it's in terrible Chinglish and I rewrite it into English. And if they don't have instructions, what I do is I simply write them from scratch. And you can get quote unquote inspiration from some other larger brands and see what they're doing for their instructions. You don't wanna rip them off obviously, advert them, but uh, you can get inspiration from them and kind of form your instructions around another bigger brands. Simply save these into a Word doc, save them into a PDF, and ask your supplier to include it with the package. It's going to cost you normally no extra cost. Your supplier will do it for free. And it just gives a better impression to the customer. They get the product and it has instructions. Nothing worse than getting a product without instructions. And of course, you can add your branding onto the instructions as well. Okay, so just as we wrap up here, and as the kids outside are starting to scream, um, just a couple of things, housekeeping things. We have our Hong Kong Mastermind on April 21st. Uh, this is in Hong Kong. So if you're going over there for any of the events going on in Hong Kong, uh, whether it's Global Sources, there's a couple other shows there. Uh, if you're going over there for the Canton Fair, check it out, econcrew.com slash mastermind. I think we only actually have two seats left and that's not kind of a scarcity tactic that I'm giving you guys. I believe that we legitimately do only have two seats left. And the last thing is that we're launching an Amazon, Amazon launch strategy. Uh, this is kind of Mike's blueprint that he's using to, when he's launching products. Now, obviously you wanna have a great product that you're launching to, but how do you get that initial traction uh, when you do release it on Amazon? And, and Mike has a really great strategy he's developed. Uh, you can apply it to pretty much any product and it'll help you get that initial traction on Amazon and basically, we call it the new bestseller launch strategy. So if you guys are interested, it's going to be released on April 30th. Uh, so this is a pre-sale. If you buy now, you can get all three courses and there's a coupon code there at the bottom. You get 200 bucks off. You're going to get everything kind of that you need to launch a brand. Uh, you'll get the product niche brand course, which talks about some of the stuff that we've talked about here, how to find products, develop them, improve them. Uh, you also get the importing from China course, how you can, and get those products from China cheaply, safely, great quality. And then of course, you're going to get uh, the Amazon launch strategy. And it includes a, great, a lot of great things in that course. You get uh, click funnels templates that you can use for your products, email templates, Photoshop templates, lots of good stuff. So check it out, ecomcrew.com slash course. And then that wraps everything up and we leave some time for Q&A. Cool. Awesome stuff, Dave. Uh, there are a couple of questions in here. I just want to mention real quick, if you do purchase the course, uh, the, the special that Dave mentioned there today, you'll get access to the other two courses right away and the Amazon course will be unlocked yes. uh, later. Um, and uh, one of the questions here was, if I already have the course, do I get access to this too? Uh, this is an upgrade. If you uh, email us at support at uh, uh, ecomcrew.com, we'll give you a very big discount. Uh, the, between the two courses. So we appreciate you purchasing the other course uh, and we'll definitely get you hooked up with a really good deal for the upgrade to the Amazon course. But the, the Amazon course is definitely a separate course. Like all, all three courses are, are marketed uh, as completely separate. We have been doing bundles, but um, it, it's definitely a completely separate course. Uh, we have another question here. Leanne's asking, once a product modification has been done in your experience, how long do you think 
your product stays a quote unquote unique for. Um, you know, I've seen varying degrees of this. Uh, in my experience, you typically get a minimum of six months. It seems like it takes someone six months to kind of catch on before a jungle scout or something uh, starts getting enough data to, to pop up on the radar and then they have to go and actually develop it and get it over here. Uh, so the quickest we've ever been like knocked off is, is six months. Uh, but typically within a year, you kind of lose uh, your exclusivity uh, within that time frame. at least in my experience. There's a couple of things that we've had a little bit longer leeway with. But don't forget that like first to market always has the most power. There, there's a lot of things that people have come along and kind of knocked off what we're doing. And uh, even though we're selling ours still for more, uh, we have more reviews and uh, just more credibility built up in rankings. It seems like we're able to to stay in the lead, uh, although our sales overall might go down 10 or 20% or something, uh, it, it seems like we're, we're in pretty good shape for, for quite a while. Dave, have you yeah. noticed yeah, kind of a similar? Well, I think the thing is too, the six months, that's kind of my experience too, six to 12 months. I think a lot of that is, first of all, it takes six months to develop a product, really. Um, by the time that you kind of find a supplier for it, uh, deal with all the negotiations, negotiations back and forth, get it actually manufactured and shipped, takes about six months. So, you know, even if somebody catches on to you day one, it's probably going to take them somewhere around six months to develop the product. Like Mike mentioned, people don't catch on day one. It does take time for people to kind of see your sales history and, you know, say, say, say it takes them six months to see the sales history and then six months to develop. I think, yeah, about 12 months is probably an accurate runway. Yeah. Um, I can add one other thing. I mean, one of the things that we've been working really hard on lately with a lot of the new products we're working on that are coming out in 2018, we're, we're trying to make them more complicated and make them even yes. more defensible. Uh, but those things are harder to do when you're first getting started. So like, I mean, remember again, that we're multiple years into this journey. And uh, as I've talked about before on the podcast and other webinars and our courses, it's important to just always be thinking about yourself relative to you and not trying to, to do necessarily exactly what we're doing uh, at the moment that you're doing it because you might be just getting started and it took us three or four years to get to that particular point before we're, we're doing that. And at, at our point in our journey, our feeling is that we're going to spend about the same amount of time, no matter what developing a product. And therefore we probably want to uh, develop something more unique, more defensible, even if we have to invest more cash uh, at that upfront moment, because, uh, you know, our goal is to develop products that are going to add at least five figures a month to our sales. So that's kind of our, our outlook for things. And uh, yeah. we, we weren't there a couple of years ago. It was a much different strategy. So kind of keep that in mind. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that's a big thing, right? Every time that you can make it more complicated, and harder to, anytime something's hard for you to change on the product, it's going to be hard for the other guys. So you know, these are easy things that you can do, which are going to separate you from 90% of the rest of the pack. Uh, but the more complex things that you can do, the less competition that you're going to have. Um, and I know, Mike, I mean, maybe you can even talk about this. Uh, I know you're developing one of your products from ground up. We won't talk about the exact product, but I know you've actually like, you're having molds made and everything. And what's that going, what that is going to do for Mike, as many people that won't bundle, an equal amount of people will not ever open up a mold and have a product developed. So the number of people now that will, that can target Mike is a very small number. Yeah. The more complex you can make a product, the, the more monopoly you're going to have on that product. Yeah. I mean, this is a, a product that we're, um, we're, we're targeting in a very competitive market, like a, a type of market where there are multiple sellers, probably the entire first page, all selling four, four figures of units per month. And we're trying to break into that. Uh, and the most of the people selling that are all using basically the same mold. It's like, the product looks very similar, probably even the same manufacturer, or the same factory doing it. Um, so we're paying to have our own, our own mold made and make a product that looks very differentiated from the rest to the point where I think it like, it, it just looks really, really cool. Like I'm really excited about this product. Actually, I just got pictures of it uh, this week and they're sending this, the, the final sample uh, that's supposed to be here, hopefully the day before I leave to go to Asia. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. So, but so is again, your mold actually, I mean, go ahead. Oh, sorry to cut you off. Is your mold done now? You've actually, you're getting now production samples. 
uh, they're actually producing a, a 3D printer mock-up and then they're going to do oh, the mold yeah. afterwards. So they're going to make the mold off the, the mock-up. Um, and go ahead. I was, there's one other question here yeah, no, real quick. Um, yeah, I was going to say, what was your process for developing the mock-up? Or not the mock-up, even the, uh, the mold. Yeah, so we, we looked at several different products in the marketplace and tried to pick the features of each one that we liked the best. And then we found something actually that was in a similar, like a cro not even really a similar, I mean, it's in the tactical space, but it was something that was a tactical product, but not, not anywhere near the same product. But like the, the body of the product had a particular pattern in it that we liked. And we use that as an example, just say like, we like this pattern. Uh, let's, let's get that in there. And it was something we wanted to design something. We, we told the manufacturer from day one, we want something that doesn't look like anything else that's out there right now. So we need to like start from that point of view of we don't want this to look like anything else that exists. Um, and that was kind of our strategy. Yeah. So you kind of give them a few drawings and they took those drawings, gave you a couple mock-ups. Yep. They gave us some CAD mock-ups, 3D CAD mock-ups, and then they are, produced a 3D printed version of it. Uh, and now we're going to get that sample. Yeah. I, I think 3D printers, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but you can take a lot of your files to a 3D printer. There's a million places online now. You simply you send me your drawing and they'll mock it up for you. Or if you have the drawing, just send it to them and they'll 3D print it. Uh, I have a 3D printer at home actually, but it works terribly. Use <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the professional guys if you want a more professional kind of idea of what it's going to look like. So yeah, 3D printing is a really great for product development. Um, the next question here uh, is from Sergey. He says, what stops the supplier from starting selling the improved product him himself? Uh, this is a challenge in China, <laughs> I will say. Uh, we do the best we can to protect ourselves. Let me give you a couple of different ideas. First of all, uh, on your purchase orders, uh, you can you basically say like, this is, this is ours only. Um, but if you ever sever relationships with that manufacturer, there's a pretty good chance that they'll ignore that moving forward. Uh, what we try to do in almost every circumstance now is when we get plates made or molds made or anything of that nature, our logo is integrated into that. Uh, and we've actually had an issue uh, just recently uh, with one of our best selling products. Someone took our plates and uh, ripped off our product. I actually think it was the same manufacturer. They deny it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that it was. Uh, and we threatened to sue them and uh, they had a cease and desist because like we were coming after them hard uh, and they, and they got it off of Amazon. And, you know, basically I think word now has gone back to manufacturers. So they think they know better than to try pulling that crap again, even though we've talked to them about it before, but uh, having that integrated in, if you have a trademark, I mean, Amazon and the legal system within the United States uh, is, is pretty clear cut with this type of thing. So if you have a trademark and someone has something uh, with your name in it, or in the case that this just happened with uh, on this other product was something that we had copyrighted. Um, so we had made a list of uh, um, color names and that got ripped off and we cop we had it copyrighted and uh, we were able to shut it down pretty quickly. Um, and it's actually happened more than once with that exact product. So those are some things you can do there. Uh, you know, if it's simply like one of the things that Dave was talking about with a bag uh, and you know, your logo is like embroidered on it, there's not much to stop someone from, just, just copying that, or even if it is your same supplier. I mean, hopefully you get a really good relationship worked out with your supplier and continue to work with them over time to where they are protecting you. Uh, we definitely have a couple manufacturers um, that, that, that look out for us in this way where you know, they'll get emails saying like, we want to copy this product from, from color it or whatever it might be. Uh, and the manufacturer will like come to us gloating that like they're not going to do that. Uh, because they, yeah. they, they value our relationship, but, but that is not the norm. Yeah. The, the actual factory ripping you off is not, well, per se, the factory is not per se ripping you off because they're not going to sell it online, but they'll sell it to another customer is the big problem. Right. Yep. Yep. And, That's what I mean. Yeah. And again, they're in business, right? They, they can't give a monopoly to everybody. They can't say, hey, we're not going to sell this product. To, they, they can't just give a monopoly for every one of the products to every market. They have to sell to as many people as possible. That's where you try to set boundaries, I think. Say, hey, you know, if they don't, one of, with one of my suppliers, what I say is, you know, any other e-commerce sellers in America, 
at least give me a heads up. Uh, you know, I'm not saying don't sell it to America, but if you have an, if there's another strictly e-commerce seller, at least give me a heads up and hopefully I get the year or the name for either axing or giving the go ahead for that relationship. Another good tip to help prevent this is to make sure that you hide your import records. Don't make it easy for other companies to find who your manufacturer is. Uh, Cause that's typically how, how it ends up working out is that someone sees you on Amazon. They're like, Ooh, that looks a like a really cool product. Let me go see who's making it. And then they just go order the same thing with a different brand name on it. Um, so if you hide your import records uh, and we have a blog post about that on Ecom crew for free, you can find that information. It's quite simple. Uh, you just send an email. I forgot the email address, but um, and you can get that blocked. Yeah. Um, any other questions? We have a lot less Q&A today. It's interesting. Uh, we have oh, about the same number of attendees. You must have done a better job than I did on the last one uh, explaining everything because I had way more Q&A, but I think you got yeah, into more detail. I, I scared everybody away. Either that or I answered everything, I think. They're still here. Everyone's still, still logged Hi. in. Either that, or they just, either that or they just like fell asleep in front of their computer. There's a bunch of people still in here. Um, My daughter still can't stay away when I tell, when I tell a story. So. <laughs> uh, Sergey says he's still awake. Uh, oh, Abby found the article. Thank you, Abby, for throwing that in there. So there's a, how to block, uh, well, here's an article about how to f use import records on, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if that tells you how to block it, but that, that tells you how to do it. Uh, Andy Perfect. says, nice job, guys. Good stuff. Uh, Andy, man, good, good to hear from you, buddy. Uh, hopefully we get to catch up sometime again in uh, 2018. Always fun seeing you. Uh, Clifford says, what happened to me in the USA, our USA factory that made our goods, just made their own and tried to sell it outright. That's cute. Uh, copy, so, yeah. Damn Americans. Uh, yeah. Copy oh, stolen the design. I put my name on it. That's effed up, man. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, this is, it's like, welcome to, uh, welcome to running a business, right? I mean, this is, th these are all things that are always a struggle. Uh, I always think, say to like, think about things that can go right. Not everything that can go wrong. Um, if you got a, a year or two, uh, of clean road to sell that product and make a bunch of money with it. Maybe that's uh, a cycle that you're always going to be going through and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's uh, just the way that it is. So, yeah, I mean, I think some people get married to the thought that you're going to have unlimited kind of exclusivity and monopoly on a product. It all comes to an end. Yeah. Eventually. Um, they just, you know, innovation. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, all right at, uh, at five o'clock anyway. So good stopping time. Uh, thank you everybody for coming on today. Uh, it was good chatting with everybody. Hopefully we'll see some of you guys over in Hong Kong at the mastermind or at the Canton fair or uh, walking around the hall somewhere over there in Asia. We look forward to catching up with as many of you as we can. Um, so until the next time, as we always say, happy selling and we'll talk to you then. Thanks guys. Summit. Stop share.